Good morning everyone and welcome to Sunday Morning Online here at Trentside. It's so good to see you. Whether you've been joining in from the very beginning of the pandemic in March or whether you've just tuned in the last couple of weeks or whether this is your first time today, we want to say uh, thanks for joining in and welcome and we really hope that we can see you soon in person to give you a proper welcome. My name is Angie German and as you can see I'm in my backyard uh, today is actually the last Sunday of summer and it's hard to believe but things are starting to become more fall like the air is getting cooler and kids are going getting ready to go back to school and uh, fall is fall is almost here and not only is it the last Sunday of the summer it is the last Sunday of our sermon series campfire stories and I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed hearing familiar ones again, uh, such as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, Jonah and the whale, uh, and also more obscure Bible stories like the one about Jehoshaphat that we heard a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, the one where the worship team was put in front of the soldiers to march into battle. I'm kind of glad that I wasn't the worship director back then. But it's been a good summer. Uh, I'm so eager to see all of you again though, and that's my heart's desire to be back in church worshiping. Speaking of worshiping, uh, I'm going to go get changed and uh, grab Luke in the house there and head to the church. And we will meet Janet there and we'll lead you in some worship. See you in a second. Good morning, Trentside. Come join us and sing.
Good morning, church. March 8th, 2020. That day has a significance now that we didn't know it had then. That was the last time that we were able to meet together in person to worship our God and to hear from his word. September 13th is another day that has significance. It is the day that Trentside Baptist Church will once again begin to meet in person to worship. Now we recognize that some of you have been itching to return. I, for one, am with you. But we also recognize that some of you are unsure if you can or, or should return just yet. Now let me be clear, you will be missed, but we totally understand. And that's why we are committed to continue to provide this service via video each week. Now when you do return to either of our sites, things will look similar, but there are some protocols that our leadership teams have put in place to ensure your health and safety as best we can. We ask that you respect the two meter rule as you enter the building, sanitize your hands at our new hand sanitizer stations, and proceed to your seating area as directed. We ask that you wear your non-medical mask while entering the building and moving about. Now when you are seated, you are permitted to remove your mask, but if you need to move about, we ask that you simply put it back on. The Trentside staff, elders, and leadership teams and their families are meeting this morning to practice what we have put in place in order to see if there are any holes. In following the guidelines given to us, we are requiring pre-registration so that we know who is coming and how many are in your family. Registration for September 13th is open now. We are currently planning on one service in both Bob Cajun and Fenland Falls. If re registration suggests the necessity, we will add a second service with time for cleaning between the services. The on-site service time will be 9 a.m. 
and space is limited. The online service will continue to be at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you there. It's our privilege now to go to the Lord in prayer. Would you bow your heads with me as, as we pray? Our God and our Father, we come before you this day in joy because we know who it is that has saved us. Your Son, Jesus Christ, is our salvation, and we cannot fully comprehend what that actually means. And Lord, may we say with the people of Judah in Isaiah 26, we have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Lord, there are many needs that we could bring before you this day. We pray specifically for the state of our brothers and sisters around the world, those who have been affected by COVID-19. We pray for their health and their restoration. For those who are continuing to work on the front lines of healthcare, we pray for their protection and for their physical and their emotional state that they might find rest. And Father, we pray also for the local church, Trentside and, and others in our region who are opening or making plans to open. Would you protect them as they trust in you, as they follow your command, for wisdom and grace as we begin to put our plans in place for regathering Trentside Baptist Church. And now, as we head into our teaching time, we pray for Pastor Matt. As he shares with us, may our minds and hearts be open to what you are wanting to teach us. We pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, Trendside. This summer we've looked at a number of stories from the Bible, and we've shared a few of the many stories that make up the Bible, and they all come together to tell the story of God's plan of redemption. This morning's story is a little longer, and we're going to look at the story of the Bible as a whole. So buckle up, this might take a while. Well, let's begin our story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was beautiful and good, diverse, wonderful, colorful. About that same time, God created man, male and female. God and man living together in this beautiful world, creator and creation, walking together, playing together, laughing together. No hurtful remarks, no gossip, no secrets, no shame. God and man living together. God gave them a job. He called them to be the gardeners of his creation, to care for it. Until one day, when an evil creature came to the man and the woman and prodded them to form a question that had never been asked in this beautiful world. Why can't we be like God and know good and evil? Now, before they could present this question to God, they formed their own answer. There is no reason. We can be like God. And they felt proud and excited by this answer and certain that they had moved to a new level of self-discovery and achievement. But as the sound of the words faded away, they became aware of a new sensation within themselves, an uncomfortable feeling. Though at the time discomfort itself was so new that they had no word for it. This new feeling they would later call shame. A desire for secrets, for concealment, for some place to hide. When God came to walk that day, man and woman found a hiding place. And the excitement that the new answer had once given now was lost. And in its place, only a sense of dread and, and alienation. God, being God, knew with sadness what had happened. And with loss in his voice, he cried out to his creation, Where are you? Even as the man and the woman stepped out from hiding, it was clear that all had changed. It was pointless to ask the origin of the wrong answer. Once stated and claimed, it became the answer for all of creation. And the dark echo that we can be like God vibrated with ugliness throughout the beautiful world. The virgin creation stripped of its innocence. It became dull gray and aged image with only a faint connection to the scrapbook pictures of younger years. Then God, in an act that was once violent and gracious, claimed the life of one of the lesser creatures and with skilled fingers made coverings for the man and the woman, life taken to cover the shame incurred. No one asked, 
why such impact from one wrong answer? Now covered, they were led away from the place where God dwelt. Once creation declares that it can be like God, they could not stay in this part of the creation. As they were led from the garden, man turned to see the way to the garden shut. They saw a figure with a fiery sword guarding it. But even as they were led away, God said to the man and woman, The story is not yet complete. With this, God ended the beginning of the story. Chapter 2 After the expulsion from the garden, many years went by and many sons and daughters gave way to many other sons and daughters. But outside the garden, life was difficult. And when not walking with God the Creator, the creation tended to forget there ever was a Creator. Garden days almost forgotten. Creation walked in its own paths, in gardens made by its own hands. Gardens which were often overgrown and dark, and which brought pain to those who wandered their paths. At one point, God went so far as to wash all these paths away, but they were quickly rebuilt. And again, they were filled with dark plants, which had no blossoms, only thorns. Thorns which would do great damage in years to come. Then, one day, God called to one of creation's gardeners and said, I will make you a family of gardeners who will learn to make my kind of paths, plant my kind of flowers. I will make you a family who can show the rest of creation the joys that were the garden that once was now is not, but shall be again. This was Abraham and Sarah. And they entered into a covenant with God and began to learn to plant flowers from the garden. They stumbled often on their way, as did their children and their children's children. But God was patient with them. And along the way, many learned the paths of the garden, even in a world that had forgotten and rejected it. As the children passed from generation to generation, They passed on as well the promise that God made to Abraham and Sarah that they would one day have a family living in a land that would be a garden kind of land where they could dwell with the one who created everything in the beginning. This promise seemed a futile one though as all the land remained as it was from the time of the sealing of the garden and now the family that was Abraham's found themselves slaves in the fields of a foreign country who recognized no God other than himself. It certainly appeared that the promise was forgotten and that God, if there ever really was God, the Creator, had forgotten his promise. Or was he perhaps simply another man made God who could not keep promises? This was not the case. And one day God the Creator looked down on his family and he, that he had chosen. And with great power, he brought about the departure. Now, the departure was the most exciting event since the creation of the garden itself. The family by this time was many, many strong. And they left with great rejoicing and optimism, for the Creator had remembered his promise. And they were on their way to the land, the land of the promise, of the garden, of God, the Creator. Chapter 3. As they made their way to this land, they were brought to a place where God met with them. It was at this meeting that God gave them many promises. And in a solemn ceremony, he adopted this family as his own. Now at the close of the ceremony, God the Creator gave his new family these words, I love you. I have made you my own. I am taking you to a place, the land where I myself will live with you. This was not as a reward, not as a payment, but as a promise and love. What I now ask of you, my new family indeed, what I require, and my requirements are neither harsh nor painful, is that you follow always these ten commandments I give you. Is that all? asked the family, surprised at the simplicity of the request and optimistic of their ability to easily keep this charge. Yet, as days melted into weeks and weeks into years, decades and centuries, 
it became apparent that the family was not able to even keep these commands. They quickly forgot about God, forgot about the departure, forgot how he had given them the land and made up, and they made up new stories of how they had accomplished all this by their own strength or by the strength of other gods who were not the creator. Oh, how the earth withered as the family left the paths of God. Again, these thorn plants thrived as blossoms shriveled. Whole plots were trampled and overtaken by the strong, just as kindness and justice were also forgotten. Some continued to invoke, the, invoke God's name and pleasure, even while they mocked the laws of the garden. The kings and the leaders God had established failed to bring righteousness to the family. Many even used their position for their own gain. Grieved, God began to warn the people of the consequences of rejecting the commandments. Yet still they failed to respond. The Creator, He sent blight and plague upon their land, and still they refused to turn to Him. Finally, God brought another people, a people who hated gardens and loved only themselves. And these trampled the land, even destroying God's temple itself. Those of the family who were not killed were led captive to another land. The ultimate consequences of failure to keep the commandments. Could there ever be a return to the garden? If even this attempt, this promise failed after half a millennium? Chapter 4 God the Creator, however, He had not given up on the return on the family. You see, this tragedy became a time of renewed promise. And to the disheartened and the defeated people, God brought a promise of another departure. As God spoke of this departure, it was often difficult to tell if its coming was near or, or far away. Sometimes it sounded as though it were to be soon, even in their lifetime of those who were newly brought to this foreign land. Yet at at other moments, it seemed that this new departure was to be delayed, only coming with the appearance of a great deliverer sent from none other than the Creator Himself. Would this deliverer come soon? Would He restore the land? Would He return the family and fulfill all their promises? These were the questions that filled the family's discussions during this time. God, the Creator, promised a new ceremony of adoption. This time, He said, the people would be a changed people, a people who would be changed from within, and that a new king would come who would make all this a reality in a new land. And so, the people waited. In the strange land of garden destroyers, they waited. It was not long before God once again stepped in to deliver his adopted people, raising up to his own purposes a new leader of this foreign people. God the Creator brought about by his power a new departure back to the land. Again, the people left a land of foreign gods with great rejoicing and optimism, sure that this meant the fulfillment of all the promises that was to be near rather than far. This spirit carried them back to the land, only to arrive to not find a garden, but shambles. And even after they finally rebuilt the temple dedicated to God, the Creator, the, the people, they lived in the land in discouragement. This return was not everything that they had hoped for. Still they languished under the control of a foreign power. Still they looked and waited for the promised deliverer. When though? And how? What was the sense in continuing on in observance of the commandments if the promise was still delayed? With this question hanging on their lips, and while they were looking the other way, God, the Creator, brought a whole new era. While they were looking for the conquering king, God brought a child, his own son. And in the midst of thorns, a blossom appeared. Chapter 5 Almost as if to disguise it from all but those who were most willing to understand, God began the final fulfillment quietly, unexpectedly, in a corner of the world, in an event that in itself was the most commonplace of events, 
the birth of a baby. To those who had been looking with expectation, this birth was not commonplace at all. But to those who were not, it could, be, it could easily be ignored as an event of little significance. It certainly was far from what most would have expected as the introduction of a new era in the story of the garden. What kind of new era could be begun by a wailing babe in need of changing? Indeed, this irony was to be the context within which the entrance into this new era would be entirely conducted. Words like small, insignificant, unexpected, overlooked, would become common with words like conquering, victory, overcoming, being used only in whispers, always tinged with the future tense, and tense it was. Now the child grew, as children do, a growth that was relatively uneventful, with no signs of the sort of early incident with a star that was now long forgotten. And yet one day, no longer a child, the son of the carpenter walked away from the shop and began to speak of a new land, a new departure, and of a kingdom, a kingdom of those with a new power within. The carpenter's son began to teach the people. He taught them that if they want to truly follow God, their creator, they are to live out daily two commands by which the garden is maintained. It is in these two commands that the Ten Commandments and the laws which they had already are summarized. The first is this. Do not forget the one who made you and love him with all your being. And the second is this, treat one another fairly with love and kindness. So who was this no longer child and from where did this message come? Ah, that is indeed the question that divided a people. Does he or does he not speak the message of God the Creator? Was he or was he not sent from God himself? Could he or could he not be, as was claimed in some way, the very Creator incarnate? Too much. Too much, said some. Too much to believe. Too much to ask. He asks too much. He asks righteousness. He asks submission. He asks remembrance of the Creator. Love, justice to each other. Too much. Too much to believe. But others marveled at the message. And in his authority and recognizing that there was something different here. Someone who spoke of things that rang true that reached within them to places that others had never reached. But they were not yet ready. But still others believed. And many of these followed and gave their allegiance to this new kingdom, its king and its values. And they followed this carpenter's son, believing him to be more than that, though not just sure how much more. He said so many strange things that they couldn't quite grasp. They often felt their understanding had turned to see his meaning a second too late. And yet they trusted him, and they desired to follow him, whatever the cost. And there might just well be a cost. See, the leaders of the day, they rightly saw him as a threat to their established security. They had perfected a method of giving outward adherence to the ways of God, the Creator, while still getting everything they wanted from the people. This carpenter's son, though, taught his followers that it is in the heart that reality resides and that adherence to the outward regulations without heart is not only hypocritical but it's worthless. These leaders of the day were not men to be trifled with. They soon made it their goal to silence this would-be kingdom bearer and sought ways to bring it to pass. Little did they know that they were only working to bring about the plan of the Creator Himself, who had sent His Son for the very purpose of taking on Himself the pain of the creation, that the way to the garden might be opened again. Indeed, the Son taught His followers that His path was through the thorns. But again, they did not understand, at least not until it happened. Chapter 6 Friday. This particular Friday found the carpenter's sons in the hands of the leaders. It found the sons' followers scattering for safety in spite of their good intentions. The day opened on an unlikely picture. 
a collection of Jews making an impassioned appeal on behalf of one of their own before the hated Roman prefect. This appeal, though not one of mercy or clemency, but an appeal for a cross. The king must die. The people who would rather die than be ruled by a foreign power proclaimed, We have no king but Caesar. Rome had made an art of executions. One more would be no hardship. He could round out a trio making their way to the place known as the skull. His back bared to the whip, his head bearing the produce of the dark garden's thorns. The carpenter's son was readied for the tree. Creation groaned at the twisting of its soil and wood and the echoes of a long ago, it is good, was drowned out by evil pulsing through the land. Friday, Friday noon, unseasonably dark. People would later talk of an unexplainable shudder down their spines. Hour after hour, darkness, ridicule, suffering inflicted, suffering endured. Friday, three o'clock, a cry of abandonment, a word of forgiveness, a convulsion of creation, and the one who had shaped creation with his hands hung limply from the tree. The son of the carpenter was dead. Chapter 7. Sunday, the first day of the week. It was on the first day of the week creation was begun. It was on the first day of the week creation was renewed. For on this Sunday, a donated tomb was returned to its owner, only slightly used. It was on the first day of the week that the sun showed himself in a new light. The message was raised to new heights. Victory proclaimed. In return, a long and agonizing scream from the depths as the reality was made clear. At the garden, the way blocking the entrance was torn from top to bottom. The one who was, who then was not, is alive and remains forevermore. The scattered followers were gathered again, grace replacing guilt, love forgiving denial. Their joy at the return of the sun was diminished only by his words of leaving them once again. The master, just restored to them, would not stay, but he left with them a promise that his spirit would remain until his return. The spirit would be their new enablement to continue on in the two commands. Remember and love the Creator and the Son of the Creator and to treat one another with love, justice, and kindness. They were not losing Him. It was just as though victory was secured, though the way into the garden was won. It was not yet time. In plans and purposes known only to God the Creator, even this great victory was only the beginning of the end and not the end itself. And what was left to the followers was the privilege to continue as the people of God, to be obedient to the two commands, enabled as they are by the Spirit of the Creator. Through the Spirit, they would be a reflection of the Son, their kindness, their grace, bearing witness to the Father's. And then with this as their path, they would live out lives of expectation. The garden awaits. Some day a trumpet will sound and the voice will cry out, Behold, now the dwelling of the Creator is with creation. And then we return with God, the Creator, to the garden. In our hearts forever the words will be, We will be His people. He will be our God. The creation will be released from its veil and, it, and, and our, final, our full glorious creation revealed for the first time since man, male and female, walked with our Creator in those first garden days. And now the story of creation, the carpenter's son, and the kingdom merges with our own. We stand where those first followers stood, in the shadow of God, the Creator, in the shadow of the garden, in the shadow of the cross, with the demands of the kingdom before us. Those who love him, God says, those who live on in his spirit will be those of the two commands. They will love and remember the creator and live in awareness of him. And they will treat one another with love, kindness, mercy, and justice. And with those first followers, we live our lives in hope 
in anticipation, in expectation of the day that cry is raised, now the dwelling of God is with man, male and female, and we will live as we were meant to forevermore. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Revelation 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Throughout this summer, we have been telling campfire stories from the Bible. And from this morning's message, I hope that you can see how the whole Bible works together one, as one story of God's love for his people, you and I, his creation. How he loves us, how he wants us to be in relationship with him. How he sent his son so that we can have life in him. The whole of his creation, you and I, we are still a part of the story. God is still working and moving in our world today. And I hope that you will put your trust in him. Revelations 22 verse 21 says this, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Thanks for joining us once again for our Trentside online service. And thanks for joining us through this summer for our Campfire Story series. 
Together, we have covered just a few of the many great stories found in Scripture. But this morning, thank you, Pastor Matt, for reminding us that these events, these stories that we have heard are just small parts of the one great story, the greatest story ever told, the story of a God who loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We look forward to seeing a number of you in a few hours as we will get a chance to celebrate communion once again at our different Trentside Outside gatherings. And we look forward to being together again next Sunday for our next Trentside online service. Have a fantastic week.